Good evening, and welcome to the National Institute of Economic and Social Research. I'm Jagjit Chala, Director uh, of the National Institute, and this event, which we're honoured to host today, um, essentially, <coughs> all but two weeks shy, is the second anniversary of my becoming Director of the Institute. In that time, and it's been a remarkable almost two years, we've had, let me go through it, a referendum, um, an exchange rate collapse, a rather surprising choice of the US president. Um, we've had a change of government and an election in that order, uh, which, was kind of, which was very interesting. Uh, a, a slightly more robust performance in the UK economy than we might have expected, but not quite the death of experts or the death of economics so far. I think we have a tremendous amount to contribute as a profession to the furtherment of policy making. And in that sense, we're absolutely delighted today to be the hosts once again of the Anglo Foundation Lectures. In fact, the Anglo-German Fellowship goes way back into the midst of time, even before this institute, which was established in 1938, was itself established. One of the very early Anglo-German Fellows was the first president of this institute, Josiah Stamp. And he spent a considerable amount of time in Germany in the 1930s trying to understand what were the causes of the events that were going on there. Of course, none of us fully understood it at the time, and probably to this day we still don't fully understand everything that happened in that remarkable decade. But we're delighted as an institute here today, devoted to the furtherment of policy through analysis, to act as the hosts of the Anglo-German Foundation Lectures. And the Foundation itself had a great role to play in some of the research done by the Institute in the 70s and 80s, very much by Sig Price, who himself was the German migrant who we were the beneficiary of his work in the UK in the 60s and 70s. I'm also grateful, uh, within the context of the anglo German Foundation, I just want to say, spend a second to thank Simon Broadbent for being perhaps the catalyst, but you have taken part in the reaction. So you're not quite a catalyst, but pretty near to being a catalyst for this process. He's been an incredible form of support in helping me understand the niceties of diplomacy, which any of you who know me still will know, but I don't fully yet understand. I'm getting it. Thank you very much, Simon, and others on the board for their support in this process. I also want to thank the German Embassy for their very kind support. We have two, uh, Frank and Oliver, here today with us. But others I know have been involved in what has been a, a complex period for many European um, economies and embassies in this period in the UK. So we look forward to further support and cooperation with the German Embassy in um, future years. I also want to thank the trustees and the Council of Management of the Institute for also providing their support for this lecture and future lectures. As you may know, uh, the lecture happens in London every other year and in the intervening years in Berlin. Uh, I'm not sure I'm at liberty to divulge the name of uh, next year's lecturer as they may still be waiting for the white clothes, the white smoke to come out of the chimney. But at some point it may, and at which point we shall announce who it is. Today's lecturer, Nicola Wuchs Schundlin, has had a remarkable career. Um, a first degree in Cologne, and for me, desperately disappointing in a way, as recently as 1999. Uh, 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 <laughs> I, 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 going on to complete her doctorate at Yale in 2004, uh, when, when I was, well, I shall not even begin to say what I was doing at that time, but it's actually remarkable in that period, the number of excellent papers she has written in helping us understand the evolution of the labour market, and what is, I think, a critical time in advanced economies. There are so many puzzles that we have in trying to understand labour supply, both in the intensive and extensive margins. The work of Nicola that helps us understand this, not only in our own country, but cross country, I think will have continuing profound and endemic, uh, sorry, uh, uh, continuing uh, influence on policymakers as we start to think about the responses of the labour market to forces that we don't fully understand, those of globalization, those of digitization, those of exclusion, those of people who are feeling uh, somewhere distant from what we've learned to know in this part of London as the metropolitan elite. How do we include them in a society that can bring about um, good outcomes for as many as possible, which might be a Benthamite uh, objective in some sense. Uh, Nicola was, um, has this year been awarded uh, the Godfrey Wilhelm Leibniz Prize, uh, one of seven economists so far in the history of the prize to be awarded it. And over lunch, she was kindly thinking that she couldn't possibly spend all the money uh, in the time that was available. I think the Institute could more than uh, help you, that's the requirement, but I, I want to congratulate you in that award. Um, 
turns to me only to um, ask you to step up and give us your lecture on hours worked across the world, facts and driving forces. I give you Nicola Fuchs Schindler. for having me for the invitation to give this uh, Anglo-German Foundation lecture. It's a great honor to be here. And as Jackie said, um, I'm going to talk about hours worked across the world. And specifically, I will talk about uh, three uh, different things. So first, I start out talking really about hours worked worldwide. So how do hours worked in poor countries compared to hours worked in rich industrialized countries? And then for the rest of the talk, I zoom in on Europe and the US. So first I will talk generally about the differences in working hours between Europe and the US and between different European countries and tell you a bit where these differences arise from in a statistical sense. So can, how much of the difference comes from employment rates, how much from the number of weeks worked over in the year or how much of weekly hours of an employee. And I will also analyze uh, differences in the demographic structure and whether they can explain these differences in our world. And then in the last part, I zoom in even further. And I'm going to show you that married women are actually the group that shows the largest differences in the working behavior across country. And I will analyze uh, taxation as one driving force of these differences. So let me start out talking about hours worked in poor and in rich countries. And I list here the paper where this comes from. So anyone interested in more, uh, more of the background or any equations, um, you can find the papers on my web page. So you might be uh, surprised that actually we don't know how hours worked in poor countries compared to hours worked in rich countries. And the simple fact is that the aggregate hours worked information that we have mostly comes from the OECD. And the poorest OECD countries, Mexico and Korea, they are already fairly rich in the world income distribution. So we really had no information of how ours worked uh, compare between poor and rich countries. And the only data source that you could hope to get this information from our labor force service from the different countries. So what we did in this um, project, we went country by country around the world, contacting statistical agencies and so on, and asking them, do you have a labor force survey or some other a kind of a micro data source that asks people for hours worked? And we were successful for 80 countries that have a representative labor force study, but then you still fa face a lot of challenges of comparability across countries. So the results that I will show you come from 49 core countries, which have um, the best comparability across countries. And specifically, the way these surveys ask about hours is they ask um, people, how many hours did you work in the last week? Okay, so it's really about the recent week and how many hours you actually worked in that week. They ask about hours worked in all jobs. So if you have a second job, a third job, or even a fourth job, that is also asked. They asked um, about hours work also if the person is self-employed or it's an unpaid family worker that helps out in the farm or in the shop of the family and so on. So all these is covered um, in these surveys. So these are the 80 countries for which uh, we found uh, data. Um, the light blue one are the non-core countries and the dark blue one are the 49 core countries uh, from which I will show you the results. But fortunately, if you look at all 80 countries, it wouldn't look very differently. And these countries cover approximately 40% of the world population. So it's not more than 40% because unfortunately we miss both India and China, which make up a huge chunk of the world population. In India, we couldn't find any evidence on hours work, any survey that asks in a comparable way about hours work. In China, we actually found a few surveys that cover specific provinces. And if you treat these provinces as countries, then China actually fits in perfectly into our pattern. Okay, but we didn't find one survey that covers all of China, uh, so I don't, don't include it here. And this is the main pattern that we find. So what you see here uh, on the x-axis is the logarithm of GDP per capita. So here on the left scale, these are the poor countries, and here are richer countries. And um, unfortunately, these slides don't come out that well, but here you have hours work per week of any adult, um, so anyone aged 15 plus. And you uh, 
see two vertical lines here and these group these countries into those that belong to the richest third of the world income distribution. This is the middle third of the world income distribution and then this is the poorest third of the world income distribution. And as you see here, uh, on average, uh, people living in the poorest third of the world income distribution work 29 hours per week and those working in the richest third of the world income distribution only work 19 hours per week. So it's a huge difference of 10 hours or 50 percent that people in poor countries work on average more than people in rich countries. So now you might be surprised by these numbers and say 19 hours, that's a low number, but keep in mind this asks every adult aged 15 plus. So it includes many people who don't work at all and report zero hours. So it's people who still go to school, younger individuals, maybe mothers who drop out of the workforce, and certainly also retirees who might not work any hours, and then they are all included in here um, with zero hours. Okay. So it's a composition of many different effects, um, but the, the discrepancy is just huge. Okay. So people in poor countries work 50% more than people in rich countries. And what is interesting is that this uh, difference in hours work that you see across the development spectrum nowadays actually lines up very well with the evidence that we have in changes in hours as one country grows richer. Okay. The best historical evidence um, that we have comes from the US. <coughs> so here I overlap to our data the US time series that comes from a paper by Francis and Ramey from 1900 to 2005. Okay. So you see here a lot of cyclicality. Here you see the Great Depression and hours in the US were depressed and then here you see World War II which was a boom. Uh, in hours in the US, but overall you see the same decrease in hours in the US that you see between our middle income countries and our rich countries. But not for the recent period. Hmm? Not for the recent period. Exactly, and then in the recent period, and I will come back to the recent period, you see an increase in the US. And in general, I, I would say in the US you see it's always a little bit on the top of everything, right? So it has a, like an upward bias, but the, the decrease is similar. Okay. And, and, um, and also, yeah, just to point out, the US in 1900 would still not belong to the poorest third of the world income distribution nowadays. We don't have any um, historical data going back further. So why do I care about our differences? As a macroeconomist, you might wonder it's interesting, but what does it tell us? Well, as a macroeconomist, um, I care about the measurement of hours worked uh, for two very basic but very important reasons. So the one is hours worked uh, matter for the measurement of welfare differences. So we know obviously that people living in poor countries, they are worse off in terms uh, of welfare because they can consume less uh, than we can do in rich countries. So if you only take consumption differences between poor and rich countries into account, where I always mean the poorest third and the richest third of the world income distribution, um, people living in rich countries have on average 12 times higher welfare than people living in poor countries. Now on top of that we find that people in poor countries, they are not only consumption poor, they are also leisure poor. They, they cannot consume a lot and they have to work a lot in order to produce and earn what they consume. And if you take these hours work differences into account on top of the consumption differences, then people in rich countries have a 19 times higher welfare. So the welfare differences between poor and rich countries, they also magnify to take these differences into account. If you also look a little bit at, at hours spent in the production of home services like cleaning and cooking and so on, and not surprisingly, those also tend to be higher in poor countries where the technical means are much worse than what you have in rich countries. The only category actually in which rich, people in rich countries spend more hours than people in poor countries is shopping. So it tells you something. <laughs> so hours matter for the measurement of welfare and they also matter for the measurement of labor productivity which Jagjit alluded to. So here I don't, uh, so I only look at these very coarse measures of labor productivity uh, uh, and the differences across countries are stark. And we used to uh, measure labor productivity differences across countries by looking at GDP per worker. So here the question is, a worker in a given country, how much GDP, how much output can this worker produce? And if you measure labor productivity in this sense, then GDP per worker is 14 times higher in rich countries than in poor countries. There's an entire 
subfield of macroeconomics, field of development accounting that tries to account for these differences. So why does a worker in a rich country produce 14 times as much as a worker in the poor country? You could think, well, obviously, the, the worker in a rich country has more capital, it's better educated, and so on. But actually, the, the literature on development accounting finds that this is not enough to explain these differences. So it remains a puzzle. So given our data now, we can actually you look on top of that a GDP per hour worked. So not only look at one worker, but an hour that this worker works. And what we find now, since workers in poor countries work more hours than in rich countries, is that these labor productivity differences across countries are even larger. So GDP per hour worked is 17 times higher in rich countries than in poor countries. So this puzzle, what can explain these differences, is actually uh, magnified by our data. And, um, the literature and development accounting is now looking a lot into institutions, actually, and whether institutional details can explain these differences across countries. So given that we have microdata, we can look at our work sliced along many different dimensions, and I can't show you all this evidence, but I just want to point out that the picture is very homogeneous. So our work per data are higher and poor than in rich countries. Um, for both margins of labor supply, so the employment rate is higher in poor countries than in rich countries, but also hours work per worker. They are higher in poor countries for both men and for women, for all education groups, so whether you look at low, middle, or high educated, uh, for all age groups, and also in all sectors except agriculture, <coughs> which is, however, a very small sector in the industrialized countries. Okay. So I just show you um, two more graphs on this, or two more slides. This is the evidence for men and women. So the same graph you saw before, just split up by men and women. So in all the countries, women work less hours than men. Um, but the difference between the poor and rich countries is actually nine hours um, for both men and women. So there's no difference there. You see, um, for women, some interesting outliers here, Pakistan, Iraq, Turkey, some other countries where the, uh, where the, work, uh, the hours worked of women are exceptionally low. And this graph is now a little bit different. Now you have on the x-axis the age, the age of uh, the worker and, um, or the, of the person, and, and on the y-axis still the hours worked per week. And now this dark line are the low-income countries, um, this is the middle-income countries, and the light line, these are the high-income countries. Okay. And what you see here in all these different country groups, we get the hump shaped in hours worked over the life cycle that we know exists in the US, UK, Germany, and all industrialized countries. But at whatever age group you look at, you find that people in poor countries work more than in rich countries. So it's also true for all age groups. The difference is largest, though, at this retirement age, where clearly people in middle-income countries and high-income countries go into retirement and stop working, while many people in poor-income countries um, continue working. All right, so, so much for hours worked uh, in poor and rich countries. So now I zoom in for the first time and um, analyze only Europe and the US, specifically 18 European countries and the US. So the data that I use continues to be the same as before. Representative household surveys, it's the CPS, the current population survey for the US. And fortunately for Europe, we have the European labor force survey. So I have one survey that covers 18 countries. So I appreciate that as a researcher. <laughs> And um, we already know from the OECD data, which is aggregate data, that Europeans work less than Americans. So in that sense, there is nothing new that I report here. But given that now I have micro data available, I can look into much more, diff uh, much more detail what drives these differences. Okay. And that's what I will do here. And I will provide you a statistical decomposition of these differences between Europe and the US. So these are the analyzed European countries. So the US is not on the slide. I just want to point out we have 18 countries and they come from all over Europe. And sometimes they talk about um, regions within Europe. So this is Scandinavia, we have Western European countries, we have Southern European countries, and we also have uh, three Eastern European countries in the sample. So these are first the average hours work per person. And now I um, focus on age 15 to 64. So now I stop at the retirement age because um, this is what the OECD does when it, um, when it provides hours per person. And here um, 
what you have on the y-axis are now not weekly hours, but annual hours. So again, that's what the OECD typically gives. So we want it to be um, comparable uh, to them. And unfortunately, I don't know, slides come up a bit differently here than on the computer, but I guess you can read it. Um, so here you have the US where average annual hours worked per person aged 15 to 64 around 1,250. And you see a huge differences across Europe, okay? I show you here the different regions and uh, those Scandinavia, Western Europe and Eastern Europe have uh, lower hours on average. So some single countries have similar hours in the US. So this is the Czech Republic and Switzerland. And Southern Europe has lower hours still than the other regions, which is partly a crisis effect. So this refers to 2013 to 2015. So if you look at it, uh, 2005 to 2007, Southern European hours are higher. They, they still are a little bit lower than the rest of Europe, um, but partly you see a crisis effect here. But on average, um, European hours are around 14% lower than um, hours worked in the US. So now, um, what drives these differences? So we look into the micro data and give you a statistical decomposition. So first we can look at employment rates and weeks worked and weekly hours worked. And then we also do a, a decomposition according to the demographic structure. So for example, in all the countries that you look at, the population aged 15 to 19 hours works relatively low hours because usually these people go to school and don't work a lot. So if it would be the case, for example, that Europe has a substantially younger population than the US, that could explain why you have lower hours in Europe than in the US. We all know this is not the case, um, so, but this is kind of the exercise that we are doing in the statistical um, decomposition. Um, and what we get out of it is that around uh, one third to one half of the differences between Europe and the US are simply due to the fact that Europeans have fewer weeks work during the year than the Americans, or translated differently, Europeans have more vacation weeks. Uh, than <laughs> so this is really all driven by differences in vacation, which are substantially higher, um, vacation days are substantially higher in Europe than in the US. And I will show you the details in, in the next slide. And then, and again, I apologize, it doesn't come out correctly on the screen. Another one third to one half um, of the difference, and that might be more surprising, comes from lower European education levels. So let me explain that. What we find in the data is that within every country, and with whatever country you pick, employment rates are strongly increasing in education. So the high educated have substantially higher employment rates, like 20 to 30 percentage points than the low educated. Now on average, uh, there are more low educated individuals in Europe than in the US, um, and very much so in Eastern Europe and in Southern Europe. So this different composition alone can explain around one third to one half of the difference with the US. So now you might think, well, now we explained one third to one half, so we are done. Um, but actually there is substantial residual. And in the residual, what we find is that in Scandinavia and Western Europe, um, these countries tend to have higher employment rates than the US, but lower weekly hours worked, while the opposite is true in Eastern and Southern Europe. Where these countries have lower employment rates than the US, but um, tend to have relatively high hours worked. So let me show that in detail. So here you have the employment rate on the x-axis, okay? And the weeks worked on the y-axis, so, so the, the black is the US, the yellow countries are Western European, the red ones are the Scandinavian, the blue are the Eastern European, and the green ones are the Southern European. And the cross here is at the median um, country. And so you see, if you look at weeks worked, um, so on average, uh, US Americans work 48 weeks uh, per year. So that means there are four weeks left. Uh, two weeks are basically taken up in all of these countries for public holidays. Mm -hmm. And the other weeks, so here two weeks only in the US, are vacation weeks. Mm -hmm. And then in the weeks work, you also have a lot of variation across Europe, from 46 and a half weeks in the Netherlands to 43 and a half weeks in Germany, where we enjoy a lot of vacation. Um, but there is a clear gap between the US and Europe. Okay. And I will talk about the employment rates in the next graph. But, and just this black line shows the correlation between weeks worked and employment rate, and there's not much there. So it's not the case that if a country has a lot of vacation weeks, then more people participate in the labor market or something. 
So this now is a, a, a um, relates the employment rate again on the x-axis to weekly hours in a typical work week. So this is the hours that you typically work in a week uh, that you work. And here we see what I told you before that um, the, the yellow and the red countries, so the Western European ones and the Scandinavian ones, they are down here in the lower right, which means they tend to have high employment rates, but low hours in a typical work week. Okay. And the Netherlands is the country with the lowest hours on average. And the green and the blue countries, so the Southern European and the Eastern European countries, they tend to have relatively low employment rates, um, but relatively high hours worked. So here you find a strong negative correlation between employment rates <coughs> and hours worked in a typical work week. And I will get back to that um, in my very last uh, slide before the summer. So, so much for the statistical uh, decomposition. So uh, for my last part of the talk, I zoom in even more now, um, namely on the population age 25 to 54. Okay. So this is a population where you think this is a typical working age. So you usually expect people in this age group to work. Uh, so differences from the young, we understand, are driven partly by youth unemployment, partly by different educational systems. And difference from the older individuals, age 55 to 64, we also understand fairly well that here retirement system, early retirement incentives, and so far uh, matter. So what we do here is we look at the population age 25 to 54, and we asked ourselves among this population where we would expect people to work, um, who actually shows the largest differences across countries. And um, I show you now a decomposition by gender and by marital status. Okay, so here you have men, married men and single men, and here you have women, married women and single women. And this first row just shows you the mean hours worked of this group across all countries, so across the different European countries and the US. And you see on average married men work the most hours, 1,760, and um, married women work the fewest hours around 1,000. Okay, so huge difference of over 700 hours annually on average between married uh, women and married men. And the singles um, are somewhere in the middle. But not only are married women the group that shows the lowest average hours work, married women are actually the group that shows the, the largest differences across these different countries. Okay, and here I measure these differences as a standard deviation. So this is just a measure that tells you how different um, are the hours if I focus on one specific group and you see the standard deviation for married men and for single men and for single women it's all around 100 okay. while the one for married women is substantially higher it's 180 so that shows you the largest differences across countries comes from the married women so there were a few hours and they also work very differently uh, this is both different remunerated countries. and non-remunerated this is only work that is spent in the market in the sense that, it, that you produce output in EPUB. The only non-renumerated work that would come in here is if you are an unpaid family worker. That comes in there. Okay. So, so exactly, it, it's kind of understandable that they work few hours, but why they have so much differences in that across countries, uh, I think it's still puzzling. Uh, as are these slides. And the last column, the last row shows you the correlation of each group's um, labor supply across country with the labor supply of married men. So obviously you have a one here for married men, but you also have fairly high correlations for single men and single women. So that means that if in the country married men tend to work a lot, then single men and single women also tend to work a lot. So there seems to be some underlying force, whatever it is, that um, that um, gives incentives that everyone in this country works a lot and vice versa. Okay. <coughs> but now the correlation of married women's labor supply with the labor supply of, of married men is almost zero. Okay. So it has nothing to do with the correlation <coughs> with the labor supply of the other group. So it seems that there might be something completely special that drives the labor supply of married women. Okay. And many people say, well, that's probably due to childcare. Okay. So it's um, the one thing that married, that married women have, a lot of them tend to, to have children, single women as well, or married women more. So it could be due to child care differences. I don't show you the details here, but if you, even if you look at um, a childless women, you see these strong differences. 
So I'm not denying that some of it might be due to childcare, but it's not that childcare drives all of it. So we wanted to understand what can, uh, what can generate these large differences across the, in the labor supply of married women. And one factor we look at is taxation. So one very simple reason why we looked at taxation is that the macro literature that looked at these differences between um, hours worked in Europe and the US has been pushing a lot as taxation as a driving factor. That's the high taxes in Europe, lower hours there. Um, so there are papers by Prescott, uh, whom you might know is a Nobel Prize winner, and Rogerson, and so on, that push that. Uh, but then we were puzzled because we think, okay, but if taxes are high in a country, then both married men and married women shouldn't work a lot. So why do the women um, react that differently? But what we find is still that taxes actually can explain part of the difference. And to give you the intuition, let me for now focus on just three countries, namely the US, Germany, and Sweden. Okay. Now, so I disregard the singles, I only focus on, um, on married individuals. And I show you here the hours worked of married men and married women in Germany and Sweden relative to the US. And you find, if you just look at married men, that married men in both Germany and Sweden were going 15% lower hours than in the US, um, which coincides with the fact that the US has lower average tax rates than Germany and Sweden. Okay, so taxes could um, possibly explain that. But then if you look at the women, you find that Swedish married women work almost as many hours as Swedish married men, but Germ as, as, as US married women, sorry. But German married women work 34% lower hours uh, than US married women. Okay, so the labor supply is only two thirds of the level than the US married women. So um, how can that be the case? Well, we claim that uh, taxation can still be a driving force, but you have to take into account differences in the tax treatment of married couples across countries. And here there you find that both the US and Germany have a system of joint taxation of married couples, while Sweden has a system of separate taxation of married couples. And what joint and separate taxation does, it affects the marginal tax rates uh, that, uh, that individuals or couples face, namely joint taxation compared to separate taxation lowers the marginal tax rate of the primary earner and increases the marginal tax rate of the secondary earner. So let me explain that in more detail. So in general, joint taxation just means that um, the tax rate that any individual in the couple has to pay depends not only on their own income, but also on the income of the other partner. And you can implement that in many different ways and um, to many different degrees. And you will see that countries do that. I, but I think the poster child of joint taxation is actually the German case. And for the German among you, you might know, or you will know it for sure, it's the so-called Ehegatten splitting. And so this is the best system also to explain how joint taxation works. So it was introduced in Germany in 1958. And how it works is very simple. You add up the income of husband and wife to get the household income, then you divide that by two, and you apply the tax function to these two hypothetical equal incomes. So imagine you have a couple where the husband earns 60,000 euros and the wife is not working. Um, this household is taxed as if both would earn 30,000 euros. So what does that mean? First, it's a nice thing for the couple because it minimizes the total tax burden of the household. Because if you have progressive taxation, then one individual earning 60,000 has to pay more taxes than two individuals earning 30,000. So from the household's perspective, it's a beneficial thing for the married household's perspective. But apart from that, it has effects on the marginal tax rates of both earners. Okay. And specifically, what this leads to is that the marginal tax rate of both spouses is now equal. So the marginal tax rate measures what is the tax rate that you have to pay for an additional euro that you earn. So now for my hypothetical couple, both of them are taxed as if they would earn 30,000. Okay. So compared to separate taxation for the primary earner, that means he faces a lower tax rate. And instead of being taxed as if he would earn 60,000, he's taxed as if he would earn 30,000. But for the secondary earner, that means a higher marginal tax rate. So if this woman in this household starts to work, right away she's taxed as if she would already earn 30,000 euros. Okay, so her marginal tax rate is relatively high. And for that to play out, a precondition is a progressive tax system. Okay, so if you have just linear tax rates, so everyone pays 20% taxes, for example, it wouldn't matter. But the more progressive the tax system is, the more it matters. And here let me shortly talk about the UK, because the UK is actually very interesting. 
the UK has separate taxation but used to have joint taxation until 1990 and then it introduced separate taxation and phased it in. Okay. And the, as I, the, it didn't seem to have a lot of reaction on the labor market and I also think it, it apparently wasn't a, a big thing to be discussed here but I think giving up the system in Germany would be a huge step. But what you have in, in the UK is that you have a marginal tax rate function that goes into steps and the steps are very wide. For example, you have the same, you have tax brackets that are very wide. So as far as I understand, for example, now uh, for an income between 12,000 pounds and 45,000 pounds, you have the same marginal tax rate. So if you have a couple that earns within this range, then whether they are taxed jointly or separately doesn't matter. Okay. So the, it, it just has much less progressivity than the German system where the marginal tax rate increases continuously. So for every euro you earn, the marginal tax rate goes up. So quantitatively, how strong are these effects? Um, again, just focusing on these three countries, I give you just two indicators. So in this table here, I just um, repeat the hours work differences for married men and married women relative to the US. And then these three columns focus on taxation so as I said, US and Germany have joint taxation, Sweden separate taxation. So this tax rate here is a tax rate, the average tax rate that a household faces if the woman is not working, so the zero stands for not working for the women, and the husband works the average hour <coughs> of US married men and earns the average wage in the country. Okay. And this tax rate, including social security contributions, is 21% in the US and 30% 30, 30 roughly in both Germany and Sweden. Okay, so that lines up well. This is a Swedish and German married men working less than the US married men. And now the last column gives you the average marginal tax rate on the additional income of the wife if she starts working. And if she goes to working the same hours that US married women work on average. So what we do here, we ask if the woman from this household starts working and works hours as US married women do, how much does the tax burden of the household increase and be divided by the income of the woman? Now, this tax rate is 29% in the US, 50% in Germany, and 30% in Sweden. So let me quickly explain. In Sweden, it's a bit smaller than the tax rate of the single earner household, just because the woman works a bit less hours than the man, and also there is a gender wage gap. Okay. But apart from that, the Swedish woman is taxed the same way as if she would be single. But now in both US and Germany, you have said this tax rate is larger than the tax rate of the single earner household. And that is exactly because this woman who starts working is right away taxed as if she would already earn half of the household income. And the difference is larger for Germany where you compare 31% to 50% because of the higher progressivity than the US. And now, by chance, it turns out that this effective tax rate of the women is the same in the US and in Sweden. Okay, so this could explain why Swedish women work as much as US women, while it's much higher in Germany, which could explain why German women um, work much lower hours than both Swedish and US married women. So in Sweden, this 30% is a combination of a high average tax rate but separate taxation, and in the US it's a combination of a low average tax rate but joint taxation. So to predict more generally how large these effects are, and especially given that these joint elements are really modeled very differently in these different tax codes, and if you know a bit about taxation, you know that each country's tax code is very complicated, so it's very hard to say where are effects, where which country implements very strong joint taxation or not. What we do is we recur to joint macroeconomic model, and I will spare you any equations here, and just tell you quickly how this model works. We have a couple which maximizes joint utility, and utility comes from two sources. One is from consumption, which is financed by income, and the other is from leisure. Okay. So when, when this couple um, has an hour available, they have to decide, uh, do we spend it on leisure, or do we spend it on working, and who spends it on leisure, and who spends it on working. Okay. Then we introduce a fixed utility cost of working for the wife. We, you need to generate just the lower employment rate by women, and that might very well be due to childbearing. And then here taxation comes in by influencing the budget constraint. So if my taxes are high for each hour's work, uh, for each hour worked, my net income is reduced. So this makes leisure relatively uh, more favorable compared to work. Okay. 
Now, what we feed into this Marco model is the complete nonlinear labor income tax codes of the different countries. So, relying on some OECD descriptions, we uh, coded all of them up. So, that was the most uh, work in terms of hours <laughs> that we spent on this project. And then, once we have this model, we ask how would married couples in these different countries adjust their hours worked if each country moved from the current system of taxation to a system of completely separate taxation? And importantly, we keep the average tax burden of the household constant. So I told you, for example, if Germany would give up joint taxation, households would have to pay more taxes. But in our model, these taxes are, are immediately given back to the household just in form of lump sum transfer. So the only effect that you have is on the marginal tax rates. And this is the result that we get. So this tells you how would hours of married women, these are the black bars, and married men, these are the gray bars, change in each of these countries if the country moved from the current system of taxation to one of separate taxation. And here this is at the annual hours difference. And just one sentence on the men, you see men's hours would go down a bit, but not by much, just because men have substantially lower labor supply elasticity than women. Now let me focus on the women. First you see your four countries where there's nothing. It's not because we didn't solve it, it's just because these countries wouldn't, uh, wouldn't, nothing would change because they already have separate taxation. That's Greece, Hungary, Sweden, and the UK. Okay. So since they already have separate taxation, uh, there, there is no meaningful move. Then you have some countries where the annual hours of women would go up by around 50 hours. So Austria, for example, you have small effects. Austria has a little bit of joint taxation because you get a little bit of a a tax break if the if one partner is not working at all, okay. but nothing more than that. Then you have your Norway, Czech Republic, Portugal, Poland, and so on. And then you have a bunch of countries where female married women's hours would go up between 50 and 150 hours. But the two countries that really stand out is Germany and Belgium. Okay. And given that we are the Anglo-German Foundation talk, and I'm German, let me focus on Germany. So for Germany, our model would predict that the hours worked of um, married women would on average go up by 280 hours a year. Okay, so just think of that as seven full-time uh, weeks. Um, so now obviously this is a macroeconomic model. You put a lot of trust in the functional form, you calibrate the model and so on, but I, be, I don't show you any confidence bands around that. And I would say I wouldn't put my hand into the fire that if Germany would implement this reform, married women would actually increase their hours by 280 hours annually. But I think what this exercise very nicely shows, and what we didn't know so far, is that uh, if you look at the international comparison of these systems, the German and the Belgian system really give strong disincentives for work for married women. So if you want to uh, ref do something on this margin and increase the female labor supply as a politician, I think the tech system is a first order issue um, on which you should work. Obviously, the time you spent producing this paper was all fun, it wasn't work at all. Was that, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> we, don't, we don't measure the, the enjoy, how much we enjoy the work, that's for sure. It's not always uh, pure pleasure, but most of it is. But then, um, so if you look at the countries where the model would predict a strong um, changes, so which have very strong elements, of joint taxation, so that's Belgium, Germany, Ireland, the US, Netherlands, and Italy. So on the next slide, I show you how the current hours work of married couples actually look at in these countries. So again, here the men are the gray. You see a bit of variation across countries, but not that much. The black are the women, where you see much more variation across countries, the married women. And you see here is um, Belgium, Germany, Ireland, Netherlands, and Italy. The, so the countries as the model would predict large increases of female hours work are also the countries where nowadays married women work the fewest hours. So that's how we conclude that the differences in the tax system can actually explain a substantial part of this variation um, of married women's hours worked across Europe. And then just one sentence on the US. The US is actually an outlier in that sense because it has joint taxation and still women work a lot. So from a tax perspective, what plays a huge role in the US is a substantially lower consumption tax rate in the US than in Europe. Because the consumption tax rate in our model is also important, because if I decide what to do with my hour that I have available, if I go to work, I'm taxed first with the labor income tax rate, but then I buy something for my income, so the consumption tax rate also plays a role. 
before I get utility. So this is one of the drivers of the high hours in general in the US. And then last uh, fact, because I think it's a lot to divulge already. Here I show you the same graph that I had before, but now only for married women. So here you have the employment rate, and here you have hours work per employed. And you, again, you see a strong negative correlation. So in Scandinavia and Western Europe, employment rates of married women are relatively high. And I was surprised to see that even nowadays, uh, so this is 2013 to 2015, the employment rate of married women aged 25 to 54 in Germany is as high as in the US. Okay. And in the UK, it's higher. Um, but hours work per employed, they are substantially below the US level. Okay. And the opposite is true for the Southern European and the Eastern European countries. So this, this negative correlation between both margins is, is really driven by the married women, and it also correlates well with part-time regulation in these respective countries. So in most Scandinavian and Western European countries, you have uh, rights to demand part-time from your employer, while these rights are largely absent in the US and in the Southern and Eastern European countries. So it seems that there are married women are a group that wants to work, but maybe not full-time, and if you allow them to work part-time, then they participate in the labor market, but they drive look down average hours work. But if you don't allow them to work part-time, many of them opt out of the labor market. So that decreases employment rate, but increases hours work per employed. And I think understanding this part-time, how part-time work evolves, what drives these part-time differences across countries, that is something that we don't know a lot about yet, so that's the next step on the research agenda. Okay. So let me summarize. Um, I showed you three different pieces of evidence. First, that hours worked are substantially higher in poor countries than in rich countries. And then that if you focus on Europe versus the US, weeks work play a role, the educational structure plays a role. Um, and then we have this difference uh, between employment rates and weekly hours worked in the different European regions. And last, uh, the largest difference is in the core working age comes from married women, and taxation is an important factor um, that drives these differences across countries. Thank you. Thank you.